Ultimately, I took what was left me in my heritage and I made it my own, which is not everyone gets that opportunity. In fact, if I had worked with them, who's to say I may have just felt like a salesperson and what I'm doing now allows me to really create my own way, my own vision, show the artists I want to show. So in some ways I have the best of all worlds, I think. Presented by Arcata, The Bigger Picture presents a special series of podcasts in partnership with London Art Week. A showcase of the best the art market has to offer, we take an inside look at the galleries participating and the stories behind the people that shape them. In 1878, Mortimer Newhouse opened his gallery in St. Louis, setting in motion a series of events that would see the generations that followed dealing in art. Despite this legacy and family ties, running the gallery would never be an option for Jill Newhouse. However, as the fate of the Newhouse legacy looked uncertain in the 70s, in spite of tradition and expectation, Jill would go on to found her eponymous gallery and establish the Newhouse name as one of the leading dealers of master drawings. As a fourth generation art dealer, and from the outside looking in, an assumption many are likely to make is that where you are today is in part due to long-standing family ties and connections, when in fact it couldn't be further from the truth. How does it come to pass that despite being born into a family of art dealers, dealing in art was never considered for you? Well, I think that the time that I was starting in my career, um, my father had a very different idea of what the path of a woman should be. And although I was always interested in art, um, he got me a job doing painting restoration. Um, This was in the late 70s and felt that that was a more appropriate place than than uh, being in the business world for women. Um, having said that, shortly after that, my father passed away. And even though um, the gallery had existed in the family since my great grandfather, since the 1870s, the late 1870s, um, there was a there was a mandatory buyout agreement between the two brothers that were that made up the gallery. So my family was bought out of the gallery. So that was no longer an option. And I was in my um, mid twenties at that point um, that I knew I wanted to be in art. I had no idea that I wanted to be in the business world. And um, it was almost as though the disappearance of my father and the lack of choice there sent me in a different direction um, in pursuit of how I would make a living, which I had to do at the time. So, and I still do (laughs) have to do. (laughs) Um, so, um, I took a round roundabout path toward it. When my father was ill, I had been working as a painting restorer and I had begun to go around to some of the small auction houses here, PB 84 and, um, I forget if Christie said Christie's East at that point. And I would talk to him about it. And he was kind of excited that I was going to auctions and understanding what that world was about. But it just was an unfortunate confluence of, of events that took that possibility away from me. So how did it make you feel that there was this traditional view that dealing in art was not a profession for a woman? Well, I was of that generation that thought that was ridiculous. So um, sadly, my father didn't live long enough for me to prove to him that he was wrong. But um, I think it made me more determined to uh, have a business of my own and, and to follow my own instincts. Um, and there was a certain... I felt I was riding the crest of a wave and in the right place at the right time in the sense of the marketplace, because it was the 1980s by the time I started my own business, was really on the upswing. The role of women in the world was changing dramatically and I felt the wind was at my back. So so I just kept following it, I guess. 
You did, however, from a young age, I think it's important we had, show an aptitude for the visual arts, as you've already referenced, which I believe was the connection to the restoration studio. Mm -hmm. If not through business then, was it through this that you and your father could relate around a shared passion? Was that something you had in common? Well, I was constantly drawing as a child. So it started at a very early age for me um, that I was interested in the visual arts. And that... um, Actually, there's a funny story. When I was about in my early teens, I did a pastel of a, I think it was of a clown holding a flower or something like that. And my father actually framed it and put it into an auction at Plaza Auction House under a pseudonym um, and bought it back, but he let it get up to like $1,000 because that was his way. <laughs> he just thought that was the funniest thing in the world that, um, you know, he gave me a fake French name and said, this is a pastel <laughs> by this person. And and uh, so he was proud of the artwork I did. And, um, and, you know, the art world, given that story, can you imagine that wouldn't be happening today? It was just much more of a each of a small private businesses, mom and pop businesses. Um, so, uh, so we had bonded over the visual arts in that sense. My father was more of a businessman. I don't think being in the art gallery was his first choice. There's a um, wonderful family legend that he was actually um, asked to try out for the for a baseball team, the St. Louis Cardinals, as a pitcher. And his father, Bert Newhouse, who was my grandfather, wouldn't let him do it because he had to come into the family business. So he um, erred on the opposite side, which was to not push us into into the art business. Also, there's a very complicated dynamic between my grandfather and my two, my uncle and my father that would have been difficult to be included in. But we had bonded over that. So. Hmm. So let's fast forward to the period in the 70s in particular while you're working at Paul Morrow's studio. I'd like to know how important does that up-close relationship with works of art have on helping you develop your eye? Do you think it changed the way you would come to view art? Absolutely, because it was run by a man named Francis Morrow who was taught by his father to do painting restoration. So again, it was a family business. Uh, the woman who's running it now, Christina Zuccheri, is still a close friend of mine, and she continues. They had developed a very specific kind of relining process that was quite well known that used glue. Um, but to be able to take an older picture, 19th century old master picture, and be able to touch it and clean it and apply paint to it was an enormous experience, a wonderful experience. And it was really through Francis Morrow that I began going around to the auctions to look at things. He would be asked by clients to look at things. I would go with him. Um, He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, It was again at that moment when scientific uh, processes in the restoration world were beginning to replace his hand-me-down learning style. So um, his business, you know, had to change a lot too. Yeah. How does it? How, how how did it? How did it feel at the time when you were uh, faced with the task of restoring a picture? With it, it's almost, it's incredibly uh, immediate, and there, there I, rem- I would imagine there's not an undo button like there is with digital processing today, where you can control Z something. How did that feel? Was was there quite a weight of responsibility there? Well, good restoration is all reversible. So uh, when you hire a young person like I was at that time, theoretically you can undo most of it except the cleaning of the of the painting but yeah to be able to touch an old painting and to be able to see the difference between pre-cleaning and and uh after it was cleaned teaches you how to read the surface of a work of art and although it wasn't works on paper it still was a fascinating way to learn about medium and to learn what a uh, work of art is made up of I'm um it's a great treat I mean it was a wonderful entrance into the work into the world of art not too long after that period in time though however you ended up working ironically in a sales role in a gallery 
So was this something you picked up quickly? What happened exactly? Um, well, the, the, there was a bit of a recession in the 1970s in the um, art market. And my I have to say my uh, art restoration abilities were pretty minimal. And so I was laid off from that job. This is after my father died. And I needed a job. So I went to a gallery because there had been a riff in my family. Um, I could not, I could no longer go to work for Newhouse Gallery. So um, I got a job with Alexander Gallery that specialized in American painting. And I am sure that most people I met at this period thought that um, I had all my family contacts, which I absolutely did not. Um, <laughs> and um, that was fine. I, I think that people were open to meeting me because they wanted to know what the story was around the gallery. The gallery was still functioning. And so I, in fact, it was at Alexander Gallery that I got a bird's eye view of buying and selling artwork because the man who ran that gallery was really setting the American art market on fire at that point. He was very dynamic and it was through him that I learned how to buy and sell and make a profit and I I really took to it. I thought it was fascinating. So I in a way I had a great combination of being able to run my own business, which means running it my own way, because my father and my uncle were very dominated by my grandfather. He was a very strong um very bossy for lack of a better word man and they were dominated by him and i really think that's why my father didn't pull me or or my brothers into the business so here i was able to make it on my own with experience as a painting restorer with a name that people were interested in and um with actual experience buying and selling in a, in a gallery and being taught by someone who wasn't my family, which sometimes sometimes is more expedient way to learn something than learning it from your own family. Like you think of um, when you're taught to drive, you usually are not taught by your parent because it's just not a good dynamic. So in some ways I had a great, um, it was a great mix of, of events that I had no control over. Hmm. In some ways, that does highlight quite an interesting dynamic in, in and of itself, because if you think about the opportunity that you were given at Alexander, Alexander Gallery, it takes someone to see the potential in someone and give them the chance. Contrast that with your grandfather, who, as you say, was quite a domineering personality. You can, you can see actually now why your father, as you said, is, is giving you that freedom and choice and is almost wanting to protect you and perhaps shield you from that as an environment. I think that I think he was. I actually think he was because I think that it was a very stressful environment as much as it was a very successful art gallery. I think it was a very stressful environment. And I, Alexander Gallery, the man who, who ran that came up, you know, literally on his own in a uh, buying and selling everything from antique toys to jewelry to everything else was the exact opposite of my background so it was an interesting combination at the time it's it's interesting though you don't you don't stay very long with alexander gallery i mean two years later we're back we're entering the, the 1980s as you'd referenced earlier and you decide to become a dealer in and of your own right and decide to make your life doubly difficult of course for two reasons one starting on your own from scratch and two which is curious deal in drawings which was very unusual for the time now what was your motivation back then to take that leap and strike out on your own i guess i'm a very independent person and i had very, already had ideas of how um i wanted to do things and how a gallery would operate i worked out of an apartment out of a room in in the apartment i was living it was set up as an office and i had clients there and um I guess I just had my own ideas. I certainly I had help from friends and colleagues, and there was a generation of dealers coming up at that time who are still around. I was thinking about this before. I mean, my friend, the the niece of Paul Morrow, is still um, running the studio. Uh, Simon Parks, Eli Wilner, people who 
started in frame businesses and restoration businesses. It was a real moment. And then um, drawings were something I could afford. So I started out buying an American drawing for $500 and selling it to sometimes another dealer for $800. And I really started that, that way. Um, but my personal taste led me more toward European taste, your European art. Um, and also I think the difference in aesthetics, if you have a pencil drawing of a landscape, let's say if it's by an American artist, the market for that is limited. I think it's still limited today. Um, whereas European aesthetics allows for that lack of finish. So, um, by the into the 1980s i bought a delacroix drawing and i ended up i bought it at sotheby's at auction i remember i was absolutely shaking when i bought it because in retrospect i bought it against the reserve and i had no idea that that's what was happening and the auctioneer leaned forward to me the bid was 2500 it was the reserve she leaned forward and looked at me and said will you say 2600 and i said okay <laughs> not really realizing i was bidding against the reserve the reserve but anyway i i bought that i did the research on it i got it framed and i ended up selling it to the indianapolis museum of art so you know, I was just very determined, I think, to to make it work and very fascinated by the idea of owning a drawing by Delacroix and, and having works of art by these artists that I studied and copied um, myself. What I think is quite interesting here is, of course, referring to the period in time being the 80s. This is before the Internet. So how on earth are you managing to find something a so specialized and whereas you've just said you're really looking for something coming from a european market essentially did were you having to travel far afield to find these things how were you sourcing the work uh well so interestingly i met a man named eric carlson who's a good bit older than me he was a professor of art history and he um had been going to france every year for many years and buying mostly for his own use and, and pleasure buying drawings and works on paper. So I went with him, must have been 1980, 1981, to, to Paris, and there were all these galleries specializing in drawings. And this was a market that didn't exist in the United States. So um, I would go around and I would look at things and, and thing, see things I would like and I would always run out of money before I ran out of things to buy in those days. And then it was really thanks to Eric, he's passed away now, but it was thanks to Eric introduced me to Hotel Druo. Now, Hotel Druo, especially in those days, was like, um, was like the Wild West. There were no rules. There were no conversion boards of the currency. There was no, um, it was just a pretty crazy place that had 10, 15 auctions every two days. So um, there was a group of us, we were all just trying to find masterpieces hidden hidden in these rooms. And um, then there, there was a certain amount of interest that was developing at that point in the drawing market. You had George Goldner who uh, took over the drawing department at the Getty Museum and um, he bought at auction a very expensive, well, what seemed expensive, a beautiful Rembrandt drawing. And it was, I'm not sure, maybe $400,000, something like that. And it was the first time a drawing had sold at public auction for that kind of money. I think this was in the early 80s. And suddenly everybody was talking about the Getty and, and drawings that are worth a lot of money. And it, there seemed to be so much activity, so much excitement around this world. So, yeah, I mean, my first clients were certainly museums, I have to say, because I could call a museum, like I called the Indianapolis Museum after studying what their collection was like and said, I have a Delacroix drawing, are you interested in it? 
And um, it kind of, so I took the drawing I had bought at auction and I flew to Indianapolis and said, here's this drawing that I have. So um, it was very much putting one foot in front of the other in a kind of innocent way, but it came together very quickly because uh, being in the right place at the right time, I think. Yeah. I think that's key, isn't it? Right place, right time. How did it How did it feel when a, a major player such as the Getty gets involved and almost, maybe too strong a word, but legitimizes that market that you're there in very, very early and had had that foresight to see potentially where things go? How did it feel? Um, it was it was really exciting I have to say. I mean, certainly I didn't have the funding that the Getty had, but it gave value to the area of art that I was trying to deal in. So I was aware in the States that I was filling a gap that had, where there were not a lot of, of galleries. I think you had Lucian Goldschmidt that sold books and prints and some drawings. Um, and, but there were, there was, so I knew that I was stepping into a spot that needed, needed filling in, in New York, but uh, at the same time, other people in other places were were also paying attention. So then, in before I think it was 1984, you had the Chatsworth sale in London, and so you had a, this group of major old master drawings come on the market and bring really high prices. So then people were really starting to pay attention. You have to remember too that artwork was not selling for $50 million at a clip or contemporary artworks for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So these kinds of numbers, even one, two, three, four million dollars was a huge amount of money. And for a work on paper, that was that was really a wake up call for the people in the United States, for buyers. So it attracted collectors. They thought it was a good idea to, to collect works of art on paper. Yeah, you mentioned, of course, that your earlier clients were actually museums, and you mentioned now of collectors. I guess that has become a feature of your business now, that you're actually dealing with collectors as well as museums. Well, I was very lucky. Again, in the 1980s, I met a wonderful woman named Karen Cohn, who was on her own collecting uh, works of art on paper, but primarily Delacroix. And that's what brought us together. So um, I worked very closely with her sourcing 19th century works um, and then other buyers started to appear too. So um, I, you know, I often think about dealing, art dealing as being, you're kind of becoming a matchmaker when it's the older art. So I'm selecting something, let's say, that I think is good quality. I have to find the person who also agrees with me and wants to own it as well. So um, it was never about the money for me, I have to say. Um, so I wasn't selecting the market of drawings to go into as a great um, marketplace where I could make lots of money. It was really about the artwork and then finding a person who agreed with me and the way they agreed with me was to buy it. So, um, it all um, just kind of fell into place in that way. Mm. We were talking recently with um, another guest that's due on the podcast, David Stern and Lelia Passaro of Stern Passaro Gallery. And one of the things that David talked about with great passion was this idea of hunting and finding and sourcing things. That has that been a major motivator? And that really, truly still excites him to this day. Is there a degree of that at play here for yourself? Certainly I get very excited when I find something wonderful, but I find that there are two different kind of personalities in dealers and one is more the hunter type. And uh, I happen to be more the selling type. What I really love is finding a home for a work of art that I have. So, um, and it's interesting. So I've been lucky to connect with other galleries and colleagues who were more the buying type. So particularly in the 90s, I connected with a man uh, named Christian Neff, who lives in London, he's, he's French, and he was specializing in the Nabi artists, and he was looking for someone to work with in New York um, to show all the works of art that he had. So that 
changed my career again in moving me into 20th century artwork, showing me um, the work of artists like Bonnard and Vuillard, who were incredibly prolific on paper. And um, it was a very happy combination because I loved doing the exhibitions and getting the artwork shown in public and finding buyers. And, and he was more of the buyer type like, um, like David Stern. Mm. Let me ask you, what, in, your, in your eyes, what does a drawing tell us about an artist that a painting does not? Um, I think that a drawing um, is the preliminary thought, usually, for, for a finished work of art. It's the very personal um, expression of an artist's vision, and it also is a moment in time. So whereas a painting shows you um, a frozen moment, a drawing usually has parts in it that take you from what went before it to what comes after it. So um, what's been of particular interest to me are drawings and works on paper that, that vacillate or that um, connect what's being observed to the abstraction or the formalist interest of setting of making a work of art on a flat surface so works that um, have representational vision at their source and then um, let it go a little bit to in favor of abstracting or um, in favor of color in favor of expression um, and so for works on paper, that kind of transition occurs more often than in a, than in a finished painting. Hmm. Now, you did mention the word uh, Nabi before. I'd like you to tell us about the Nabi and the appeal of these works to you and how, this, how you see this movement having paved the way for what followed. Um, well, uh, the Nabi artists were the first group to recognize the flatness and of the painted surface. So um, there's a famous quote by Maurice Denis um, about the, actually I think it's Serousier, about the flatness of the painted surface that every artist of all period is aware of visually when they're making a work of art. But the Nabi allowed the flatness to, to dominate the images that they were producing. They started in the theater, they were making backdrops and theater decorations, theater programs, and carried what they learned from there into their finished artwork. So I believe in the change in the pictorial space that occurred in their hands, that uh, it opened the door for the abstraction that came afterwards for uh, Picasso for Cubism for um, for the whole twentieth twentieth century. I mean, fast forward to today, um, for the last sixteen years, in fact, the gallery has been run by yourself and the gallery director Krista. Now, to have worked with someone for that length of time, it surely means you must complement each other. How did you two meet exactly? Um, I was looking for an assistant and Krista had been managing a paper restoration studio for five years and she had been planning to go uh, into the gallery world and um, we met and we hit it off. She was um, had great expertise in, in conservation and in framing works of art, which was very helpful. And we, our personalities just clicked. And um, yeah, we, it's been great. We um, have really worked together wonderfully. We've traveled together to do fairs in, in Paris and in London and, and have really built up the business together. So it's really been great. Now, more recently on your Instagram, there's a picture of the back of a painting and an old deeply patinated label reads M.A. Newhouse and Son. Now this of course is referencing, as you already have mentioned, your great grandfather Mortimer, who founded the gallery in 1878 in St. Louis. How does knowing where you've come from and what you've had to overcome change the way you view life and business? Well, I, 
I recently realized that when Mortimer Newhouse started the business, he was a book dealer primarily, and he began to show illustrations, works by the artists that illustrated the books that he was selling. So in fact, he started out being a works on paper specialist, showing artists like Cropsey and Remington, American artists. So that actually makes it feel like my path has come full circle, which is really lovely. Um, it's been a wonderful feeling to carry forward a name that uh, was so well known and respected over the years. Um, and it has allowed me to get back what my family lost and and rebuild a business that you know, that my father was involved in. So it keeps me connected to my heritage, which is really wonderful. Mm. I think that's an important point to get back what you've lost, because of course, there has been uh, historically a, a period of difficulty there in the family. And you've had to overcome quite a lot to get to where you've got to today. And that could be easily overlooked. I mean, today, how does it feel being in, in one sense, you know, the torchbearer for the new house name? What do you think your father would have to say about <laughs> Oh, I think he'd be thrilled. Um, but, you know, family businesses are complicated, complicated animals. And um, I'm sure most people who are involved in family businesses have stories to tell. I, I think he would be thrilled that I made it independently. And, um, and ultimately, I took what was left me in my heritage and I made it my own, which is not everyone gets that opportunity. In fact, if I had worked with them, who's to say I may have just felt like a salesperson and what I'm doing now allows me to really create my own way, my own vision, show the artists I want to show. So in some ways I have the best of all worlds, I think. Thank you for listening. You can follow and subscribe to The Bigger Picture wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about this episode or to reach out to us directly, please visit arcata.com.